Hello, everybody. Welcome to Wholehearted Loving. I'm Stephanie. Hi, I'm Georgiana. Today, we are going to be talking about the energy and the feelings in our bodies when good things are happening. So like cues that our body gives us that we might not even clue into that we're having a good time with people or in life or in situations or circumstances. But before we do that, we will do a body-based self-connection practice to connect with ourselves before we connect with each other and this podcast. Okay. We're going to make a sandwich. (laughs) We actually might have done this practice before, but today I feel like calling it a sandwich. (laughs) (laughs) And I was imagining doing this. I already put my hands in the spot. I'm like, oh, I'm making a Georgie sandwich. And then I realized most people probably know me as Georgiana. But Georgie is one of the names that I went by for a really long time by my really close friends in school when I was in elementary school. And they all sang the Georgie Porgy song. Cute. <laughs> so that was a sweet moment there. So let's uh, find your anchoring spot. Find that spot where you feel most connected with your body and a surface. And then let that body connection remind you to give some attention to your breath and see what's happening there. And then to make this sandwich, you need a slice of bread behind you. So that might mean like putting your hand behind you somewhere on your back. Or it might mean leaning into the chair, leaning into the wall, leaning into whatever you might be laying on. And then you need that toppy top piece of bread, which is on the front of your body. <laughs> so you could use your hand, you could hug a pillow, anything that gives you that extra awareness that something is on the front of your body. Yeah. And you have just made a sandwich. A me sandwich. <laughs> And in between, notice what's like in between your sandwich. So in between, like that's where things swirl around or your fears reside or your dreams show up in your body, you know, things that excite you, like Steph was saying, you'll feel that somewhere in your body. All of that is in between your bottom piece of bread and your top piece of bread, your back and your front. And we're learning to hold and be with all of what is within us and almost saying everything here that's swirling around right now is welcome and I'm learning to be with it even if it's uncomfortable Hmm. yeah and just notice any changes in breath notice if any yawns come notice if your posture wants to change Notice if your body has any impulse to move or stay still. And just notice how it feels to essentially be holding yourself. Can you connect to a sense of, I've got my back and I'm caring for my heart? You can stay here for as long as it feels good to you. And if it feels good to change things up, you're welcome to do that as well. This is so nice, isn't it? Yeah. I have a chair with a back right now. So that was my my back bread. (laughs) And then arms crossed in front of me with a, a little blankie. So I felt like a croissant sandwich with my arms <laughs> crossed, <laughs> like a like a peaceful excitement croissant sandwich. The meat mm-hmm. is the peacefulness the and excitement. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> um, I saw you because I can see you. I, I saw you. I think first maybe go with hands on your body, and then you changed and you brought the blanket in. What mm-hmm. what happened? Like, what did you notice that said, "Oh, maybe hands isn't the thing for right now." I wanted extra weight and uh, an external object that felt um, a bit more flat. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
So it's nice to notice. And you might eat mm-hmm. like you, you maybe you tried something and like sort of before you got super into it, you sensed, hey, maybe something else would fit better for this moment. And I think that's a good thing to remember is that a lot of people get stuck with, I don't know. I don't know what I need. I don't know what I want. And I try to remind people, just try something. And I'll give you information. Just try something. And then notice. That's so exciting because the the amount of shifting that a person can experience with that. Like I definitely, you know, seven, eight years ago would not have had any sense of what I wanted. It would have been a totally intellectual endeavor. Like what might I want? What should I want? I want nothing. As a person who felt like I needed to want nothing and desire nothing, that was reflected there. And like, what would make my body feel good right now? Nothing. I will just sit. And you know? suffer. <laughs> yeah. Without yeah. even realizing that I was suffering. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think years ago, if someone would have asked me what I wanted, my immediate answer would have been, I don't know. And I don't Mm -hmm. think it's because I really didn't know. I think there was some element of not knowing myself well enough to know, but I think it became my default answer. And I've noticed that in working with people as well. Sometimes I work with people and like, I notice their default answer is, I don't know. And we'll talk about that. And I said, do you notice that? You know, do you notice what you, how you respond to me when I ask questions? And do you notice that? nine out of 10 times, sometimes 10 out of 10 times, it's an immediate response. And it's the, the, the consistent responses. I don't know. And I remember talking to a client one time and she said, Oh, I didn't realize. And yes, that's what I do all the time. Right. And Mm -hmm. for me, that came from assuming that other people knew better than me and she could relate to that. Mm. assume that I can't trust my own knowing, which she could relate to as well. And also um, for me, a big part was I don't want people to think I'm weird. What will they, what will they think of me if I say out loud what I want? Mm-hmm. Maybe I won't fit in. Maybe I'll look right. strange or sound strange. So it's been a process for me to, discover what I want, notice how my body lets me know what I want or don't want. And then having the courage to say, this is what I want, or this is what I don't want. And I don't really care what you think. Mm -hmm. It took me a long time. What a more exciting option as well. You know, it's funny when you were describing that, I was thinking, you know, sometimes like what I might want right now is to touch the back of a turtle like rub my hand along a turtle's back. And Mm -hmm. I'm sure for many people, they'd be like, that's weird. (laughs) I just had the thought, I like imagined it in my mind. I'm like, I would not want that. And also I would not think of that. And neat. (laughs) Neat. And, you know, seven years ago, I would not have thought of that. And I would have thought that was weird. The other day you asked me what would feel good, what I needed. And it was, and it didn't even need to be possible. It was to curl up on the belly of a giant polar bear, you know, I can approximate that with a fuzzy blanket or rug, but uh, just neat to notice, you know, what more opportunities might arise if you were able to know what you wanted and articulate it, you know, maybe someone would come along and say, geez, I've got a turtle right here. Do you want to give it a rub? Or you know, options. you never know. Fun. I do not have that you option for you today, but someone else might. That's cool. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so okay, all of this ties in. I mean, everything we talk about ties into body awareness, relationships, experience in life, basically, the kind of experience you're going to have in your life and relationships and how you're gonna feel in your body during all of that. Mm. And what's been coming up for me a lot this week, and and something I've been learning over many years, is really simply like what feels good to me, and what Mm. the manifestations of that are. And in this particular case that I'm thinking about, it's the difference I feel in my body, after having spent time with certain people or in certain circumstances or things that really, I think the phrase they use these days is that give me life, you know, mm-hmm. touching the back of that turtle gave me life. <laughs> um, this week, I mean, I've been having a 
time of like challenge and uncertainty for many months. And during that time, I've trusted that I need to sink into myself. I know that this is a season that's transitional. Um, I know that better feeling times will arise. And I think those times are springing now. It's still January, but it feels like spring. Mm -hmm. And so I spent some time with some people a few days ago and I got home and I just felt like really jazzed up and I wanted to sing and play my guitar. And I was like, that's a really key representation. You know, when I feel like I have to pick up my guitar, I'm like, I am full of beans, I'm full of energy, I'm full of excitement, and I need to move it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, I noticed this week that like my skin feels more clear, my breast tissue feels healthier, like all of these mm -hmm. things uh, may or may not be manifestations of, you know, energies I'm experiencing with people that feel good to me. But it put me on this track of remembering what I thought used to feel good, what used to feel comfortable for me, what used to feel mm -hmm. comfortable for my ego and my fears and my anxieties would not manifest in healthy ways in my body. That you could objectively mm -hmm. write a list of like, what am I experiencing? How is my body feeling? What activities am I naturally drawn to? Mm -hmm. um, those would be like night and day depending on who I'm with and what I'm doing. And it's so neat to be able to notice on the on the front end kind of um, what our tendencies are and how we're feeling and then look backwards at what we've been doing, who we've been with and see how those are related. Yeah, it's really neat. I'm curious um, when you say there are things that I would have, I think you said felt good with before that mm -hmm. really wouldn't feel good now. What were those things? And also what was the quality of it felt good then? Was it like, it feels good in my body or it was like, I think it feels good mm -hmm. or everyone tells me it feels good. So I assume it feels good. Like what was that experience like with some of those things? Mm -hmm. So it feels safe and I understand it in that it, it jibes with my worldview. So mm. when my worldview was that like I was an undesirable piece of crap, I mean, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm embellishing a bit here, but um, the world is a dark, scary place used to be one of my worldviews. You know, things are hopeless. Mm -hmm. um, unconsciously, a feeling of being unworthy of love or being seen or, um, you know, not having anything useful to say. So anything that proved that to me felt good in a bad way you know, right. um, and the activities that go along with that, you know, mm -hmm. let's all be miserable and just smoke and drink. And, and then what feels good is smoking and drinking, which obviously doesn't actually feel good. I mean, in doses, these things might feel exciting or fun or, mm -hmm. um, but overall, the sensation in my body and the experience that my body is having, these are objectively not good feelings. Um, and were you aware of those objectively not good feelings or were you disconnected from that at the time? Totally disconnected, disconnected right. from my body, my thoughts, no awareness of any of that. Just, mm -hmm. just trucking along. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And but like the thing is it fit with the energy that you were used to feeling in your body, which was more of that. If you want to call it like lower, heavier, like not yeah. light and uplifting energy yeah. not hopeful energy about yourself or the world or people totally yeah right yeah. and so then i'd be wanting to connect with people who had those same worldviews that felt safe and made sense to me mm -hmm. and it's so ironic because the whole message there was that basically like nothing is safe and we can all be like miserable and safely together deciding everything is unsafe um yeah totally different yeah. totally different vibe i'm curious like Growing up, was that a familiar inside body experience of like feeling sort of down, the world is not to be trusted? Like what happened where that became sort of like homeostasis, familiarity, home base for you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny because my family isn't like that. Like they're pretty mm -hmm. positive, productive, healthy people. 
um, there definitely is a thread of like snark and eye roll kind of a vibe, which mm -hmm. can be fun and healthy or can be unconscious and like kind of dangerous. Um, I think it was a, probably a bit of both, but more on the fun side, but that didn't affect how I interpreted that as a child, right? It, that was just some mm -hmm. unconscious thing going on. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the experience of not feeling that my that my emotions were held or understood. There was some feeling of like I should be different in that way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then my experience in elementary school was sort of being an outsider, like a loud, gregarious, know-it-all outsider um, who like wasn't invited to birthday parties sometimes, like that kind of vibe. So I think that really went to inform my unconscious belief system. Mm -hmm. um, and then when I started doing social work, so high school was quite a shift actually from that. I became popular. People thought I was funny. I kind of got along with everybody. And from that place, I felt incredibly well resourced. Mm. And, and I just wanted to help people and connect with them. So I started doing social work. And that I was not aware had an incredibly detrimental effect on my psyche and my worldview and my view of self where everything became mm -hmm. a scary us against them. Yeah. Um, yeah. It went from kind of a feeling of wanting to champion the underdog and support people to feel loved more into this, like, yeah, I can join you in this place where we all agree that no one can really feel loved and like everything is a mm -hmm. slog and, you know, mm -hmm. abject misery and poverty and things that are true, but also um, are informed by a worldview, which is optional. Right. So you're describing like sort of a shift, right? It changed sort of your worldview, your view of self, it sounded like the changes that happened so far weren't like that, like intentional. They just sort of happened. Yeah. So what happened after that piece of being in social work, your worldview sort of gets darker, heavier, like did it then shift again on its own? Did you have to be very intentional to shift it? Mm -hmm. Was there a point where you're like, I don't want to live with this view of self and worldview anymore. What happened no. from that place? I was unintentional in every regard until, <laughs> until suddenly I wasn't when I was like 34. Um, no, I just a giant dissociation. So my life became a festival of dissociation. Um, drugs, alcohol, I mean, not big drugs, just some weed, but um, anything I could do to dull all the big feelings that I didn't know I was having um, mm -hmm. and all these social anxieties that I didn't know I was having. Um, I had a bit of a breakdown. Like I remember waking up and just crying and just being like, I can't go on. Like, what, what is this? And I phoned my boss and I explained what was happening. And this was social work. So it was, he was open to this. He was like, Oh, you're, you're depressed. Like <laughs> you need to, you need to call the union. He suggested I take a leave of absence, which I did for six months. Um, so I was actually, you know, a functioning dysfunctional person, which I think so many of us are. Um, so I would say that was semi-conscious taking a, taking a mm -hmm. conscious break, but I was unaware of anything that was going on inside. So how useful right. is that? Um, okay. Well, you were aware enough to say, I don't want to feel this way anymore. This doesn't feel good. I don't want to feel yeah. this way. Something has to change. It wasn't even that like that is even more positive and productive. It was just like, I can't. <laughs> Like I can't, oh, it's not, I don't want to feel this way. It's like, I can't. Right. I can't and I can't, can't is a good thing to feel yeah. and have awareness of, especially if you pair it with, and then I'm going to tell somebody or, and then I'm going to do something other yeah. than just swim in. I can't or drown in. I can't drown in. <laughs> I can't. Yeah. Yeah. I really wanted someone to tell me what to do. Like having a boss tell me you are ill and you need to stay home is so much yeah. easier for me than being like, Hey, I'm ill and I need to stay home. I mean, now I'm good at that, but that's um, interesting. Hmm. yeah. Yeah. It just reminded me of something. Can I share what it reminds me of? Mm -hmm. So I was in a job corporate for a long time and it made tons of sense on paper. It was fantastic, but I felt like I was dying inside and I had that same feeling. 
I can't. And I think I called my boss too and said, I just can't. I don't even know what the answer is, but I can't. And she said something, probably something like, take some time off. And then she also said, if you need to work part-time for a while and like give yourself the opportunity to really get clear on what you want career-wise and if this is the right fit, take that. That's okay. And I was swimming and I can't or drowning and I can't for so long and sort of panicking, thinking, what am I going to do? Am I going to throw my whole career that I worked so hard for away? What will I do if I walk away from this? And her saying, you can take time off and you can even work part time. And I, I think I cried to, to just acknowledge that I had the permission to just stop the thing that I felt like I couldn't do anymore. And what was neat was I didn't even need to work part time to notice what I needed. I just needed someone to tell me it's okay mm -hmm. to stop. And then the next day I was like, I'm quitting. <laughs> I need to quit. <laughs> like it was that clear to me, but right. I didn't feel like permission to stop. Yeah. Right. And so what you just shared remind me of that. Like sometimes when we're in that, I can't, we just need someone to tell us like, you can stop, you can take a break. We yeah. can reset. We can reevaluate. You don't have to white knuckle your way through this. Yeah. The answers are often that simple. You don't have to. You can stop, you know, even when that feels impossible, even when it feels financially impossible. There are often more options than we're able to see because we're, mm -hmm. we're complicated creatures. <laughs> and also very resourceful when need yeah. be. Yeah, totally. Yeah. So let's see. I kept making big life changes um, because change feels good to me. Change feels like a fresh start. It gives me different kinds of energy, but all of it was unconscious and unintentional. So I didn't really notice what was happening. And these shifts that felt like they were the answer were mm -hmm. temporary. And, um, so changing careers, moving away, um, all of these shifts, but I just brought myself with me everywhere that I went. And okay, can we pause? My, can you say that again? <laughs> brought myself with me everywhere that I went. Yeah. I think we forget that yeah. sometimes that, oh, at some point change is great, but at some point I might have to actually deal with what's inside my sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> Right, because yeah. I'm bringing it everywhere with me, and yeah. I think what's neat is when you say the like I view it as the courage to change careers, the courage to move and travel the world. All of that takes courage. I think it brings a lot of you know goodness into your life, and also it can become a coping mechanism, right? And I think mm -hmm. we spoke about that in one of our previous episodes. Um, were you aware at the time it was a way of coping for you? No, no, aware, really aware of nothing, just going where felt safe and comfortable where, and I want to emphasize it felt safe for my ego and for my fears. So, um, all of the people I was associated with, I mean, there'd always be a thread of truth, um, things that were true and dear to me, I would maintain, but overall the people I was spending time with and the activities we were doing and the jobs we took on, like everything in my life reflected this deep lack of self knowing. Um, mm -hmm. And then of course the natural seeking of, of love and connection and comfort, but mm -hmm. it wasn't comforting my soul and like my deepest self, it was comforting the surface. Um, and piling a bunch of band-aids on a big old wound is just going to result in some unpleasant festering. I think it won't be, won't be healing and it won't feel good and it won't smell nice. No, I had a visual of that just now. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it's very clear. Your point is very clear. <laughs> point is very clear. Yeah. And I didn't shift into any of these things. Like I think the, um, this all sort of culminated and peaked right before I started this work. And I, I reached deep back into my past and reconnected with this man that had felt like that felt like the 
safest, best thing. It, it checked off all of the should boxes of like society and family and career. Um, I felt I could trust him and like we understood each other deeply and all these things that weren't true, but felt true to me at the time. Um, and that level of safety was so false. And if I look back on how was my body responding, like what kind of, it's just like, oh yeah, that was definitely not the thing. And I wouldn't have been able to tell you what the thing was at the time. And having taken this long ongoing journey of discovering what that means in my body and noticing mm -hmm. the simple ways that good feelings are expressed now that that mm -hmm. right relationship is expressed is just so neat and um, subtle if you're not noticing and really obvious if you are. Mm -hmm. So if like with hindsight, were there signs your body was giving you that this actually doesn't feel good? Like, yes, my body over the years has given me many signs that things were wrong, um, mm. including like vomiting, um, mm -hmm. sim like reproductive symptoms, like cysts and things like that. Um, I think externally, I mean, I, I remember I recorded a, marketing video with uh this guy and i thought it was really impressive <laughs> and now it would make me cry to watch it and you know after the fact you know there were a few people who were just like oh wow this looks great and most people were quiet and now mm -hmm. i notice i'm like ah when there's no response to something i'm putting out in the world it's because the thing i've put out is not ringing true in some way and mm -hmm. i remember years later my aunt told me i saw that video and i felt like you were being held hostage like it felt like mm -hmm. you were being forced to make this video and i was like oh damn well i wasn't either of those things and how insightful um that was noticeable, you know, on the outside. So whatever, you know, when you'll hear people say like, oh, I notice you coming back to life or things like that. Like we yeah. can tell you've been feeling not great or something yeah. like that. And it's so great to see you coming back to life kind of thing. Those are all really great indicators that something yeah. happening is true and good. Yeah. I remember like my cousin said to me um, years ago after a hard period, she's like, I think she said that's something like, I felt like you died. Like I obviously didn't, but she, I don't know if she said, I felt like you died or part of you died, but there was definitely a death. So people feel our energy. And they I do. definitely felt like death too. Yeah. Right. They noticed. And yeah. they noticed and it felt good to track. Oh, I think something's coming back to life. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and hearing you say, like, before we got on the call, you said this or on this podcast recording. And then during the podcast, you said it. And both times you said it, I felt a little spark, which was that you felt excited to sing and play the guitar again. Because to me, that is such a true part of who you are. And I know that, you know, the last couple of years, there have been times where in my vision, I, I still see you that way. And I'm like, oh, it'd be so lovely, you know, like if to hear you sing again and watch you play because I've seen you play and listen to you sing in those times in your life, I think, where you felt more alive, right? Mm -hmm. And I remember that. And I remember that energy that was in you and what you exuded and how that felt for me. And I think, you know, along the way, I might have said, oh, wouldn't that be nice if you, you know, brought your guitar and went and sang with Shay and everyone? And like, you're just like, yeah, no. <laughs> you know, you, you had very clear, distinct answers that were like, not, uh, yes, I would love to. And I remember hearing that and like feeling a little sad and then also trusting that that's just where you're at right now and that's okay. Um, so I wasn't like overly concerned, but I just recognized, oh, she's in a different season of life right now where that doesn't feel like the true thing. And mm -hmm. so it just makes me really happy to notice that that part of you is coming back to life. Me too. Yeah. You know, it's funny because that part of me, there's many parts in there. Um, I actually, the only reason I ever got a guitar was because I had a crush on a boy when I was 14. So I part of I'm it feels 
What? I think a lot of us do things like that because we had a crush on somebody when we were 14. Yeah, yeah right? But the so only it, reason you know, I watched hockey was because I had a crush on a boy when I was like 12. Yeah, I've done, <laughs> yeah, that, I've done that with hockey as well. <laughs> but I actually genuinely like it now. So yeah. thank you for that boy. <laughs> right. Well, that's exactly, yeah, what I'm getting at is that <clears throat> there's a part of me that really likes to sing. There's a part of me that likes to play the guitar and feel the vibrations of the guitar. There's another part of me that's like, well, I don't actually know this guitar. I can't read music. I can't produce the notes I want to. I can just kind of copy people or produce basic chords. Therefore, it's not true, right? I've got this needless expertise judgment going on. Um, mm -hmm. And it's interesting to try to extricate these like subtleties within like what, what is true song for me is true. Uh, different moods where that none of this is true are also true. Uh, it's a lot. There's a lot of layers. So how do you know, like, how does your body tell you right now that music and guitar feels true and feels I in alignment? can feel the feeling in my hand. It's, pulling the guitar i i like <laughs> move toward the guitar and pick it up and feel this bursting forth inside my chest and abdomen and it's like a bubbly excitement thing mm -hmm. what yeah. do you imagine you had to clear out or learn to sit with in order for this spaciousness to be there for this energy to be felt and for energy to want to like move forward and pull you forward because you were not in that energy state some time ago. Mm -hmm. So sorry, what was the question? What changed that? What, what did you have to sit with? Like, what, what was the gunk in between then and now? Because I'm imagining we couldn't have forced you to feel this. We couldn't have convinced totally. you to feel this energy. Like there's no amount of mind work or pressure that's going to create this specific type of energy and vibration and feel, mm -hmm. right? This comes from, I believe, a spaciousness. Mm. And then room to reconnect with like, who am I truly? What excites me now? Right. But like when we're living with a whole bunch of gunk inside us, emotionally, yeah. sensations wise, there's no room for this. So I'm curious, like, yeah. what was the yeah. journey to what did you have to learn to sit with and swim in and drown in for a little while mm. in order to like have some space for this to be happening now? For me, it's a very much related this specifically this guitar and singing thing with external energies bringing some sense of excitement and movement to my life. Mm, um, okay. So I can picture this this desire to move toward the guitar and sing might have always been present despite my having cleared out much gunk over the last many years, um, right. but the spaciousness for me now is not about necessarily clearing out gunk. Like it's not like over mm -hmm. the last week I've cleared out a bunch of gunk and now I want to play the guitar. Mm -hmm. It was about spaciousness of sitting with the feelings of, you know, everything that means I don't want to play the guitar, which is some kind of lower energy and like letting that mm -hmm. be okay and making, making room for it, but also taking steps for whatever I do have energy for. Um, mm. which I, I think we were going to have another episode about that, what we're ready for and what we're not ready for and just noticing what's in there. Um, right. So yeah. you notice, Hey, I can either stay stagnant with this energy that's in me. I can not do anything and that wouldn't really change anything. But there yeah. was some part of you that said, I actually need to take some sort of steps. Yeah. And it was taking some sort of steps that created space for this to happen. Yes. And in a really compassionate way, like I knew I was in a place of being stuck and of there not being much room to move and not a lot of energy to create change or to do energizing things for myself. But within that pool of potential activities or ways of thinking or body-based self-connection practices, within that pool of what was possible, which ones did I feel I could actually access right now in a way that was inspiring and not forced or um, not pushing myself anywhere from a place of shame, but rather from actually mm -hmm. clocking my energy and desire. Um, right. Yeah. 
Are you open to sharing what some of those little action things were? Yes, it's very wizardy woo woo. Um, okay. You're welcome, wizardy woo woo, <laughs> even though I don't understand it. <laughs> well, so about three months ago, three, four months ago, um, you know, for long term listeners, you'll know that I'm in a mystery school in a temple in Vancouver. And so we have these rituals based on various things. And uh, I joined the, we had an extra chat room for accountability. So for people who, um, you know, it's easy to fall off doing your ritual practice or your meditation practice or your dream journaling or whatever it is. Um, so I just committed a really simple, I knew that I wanted more magic and more practice and more ritual in my life. And I felt like, I really sneery about it. Like I know how potent it is. And I was just like, I, something about me is resisting. Right. So I was like, okay, I think I can commit to a five minute meditation and one brief ritual a day. Right. And having this accountability group helped me do that. And after a few months, um, you know, energy's shifting, ethers are shifting. And I realized what felt more important or true was no longer this five minute meditation and the one ritual It was that I specifically wanted to dedicate time and energy in a ritualistic way. So I want to be burning incense. I want to have a dedicated space. I want to put on the magical robe and then mm -hmm. whatever happens from that doesn't really matter because it's the dedication that, that matters. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And all of that is to do with intention and energy mm -hmm. and creating that vibration for yourself, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. and trusting that something will come. That's the piece and trusting that something will come because I imagine, I mean, you've had more experience with the, these practices, so you probably have a, a sense of how it changes and impacts your life. But like you doing a five minute or a one minute meditation, you doing one ritual, like it doesn't actually immediately change huge things for your life. Like you don't see any like outcome right away. Right. Yeah. And I want to highlight this piece of when we feel stuck in life, um, we think that in order to get unstuck, you have to have some big thing you have to, you do. And it's going to be obvious that it's going to create this huge change for yourself. And I don't actually think for the most part, that's how it works. That's not how it's worked in my life. It was just, I feel stuck. I don't want to feel stuck anymore. And I realized that if I want to feel differently, I want to experience something different. I have to do something. And I often don't know exactly what the do something is. I just have to do something. Mm -hmm. And that's what I hear you say. Like I just started doing something. And then the doing something led me to, oh, I think I want to do it sort of like this way or this type of a something is what feels more true or in alignment or feels like it gives you something more. And then the, the sort of culmination of all those small actions that seem to not be related to anything puts you in this space where now all of a sudden you're like, oh, I feel the pull towards a guitar. I feel the pull towards singing again. And that's yeah. a big shift that we couldn't have forced in a different kind of way. Yeah, hundred percent. Neat. I like yeah. that. I also want to yeah. add for any of you that relate to me, I have no idea what Stephanie's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> like really, like when it comes to like magic school and ritual and you know robes and things, like I have a general sense, but I don't understand how it works. Um, and I think what's really neat is I see the joy it brings to you and the calm and peace it brings to you and our other friends. I feel no need to understand it deeply for my own self and to support you in having that in your life. And I know that there was a time in my life where everything had to make sense. I had to understand it. And if I didn't understand it, I would automatically deem it stupid and dumb and a waste of time. Mm -hmm. And, and it just feels really nice to be like, I don't get it at all. 
there's some parts of me interested, but probably never going to be interested enough to really dedicate time or very much time in understanding it that much more. And I so love it that you have it in your life. And I so support you in doing things that feel good for you that I know don't cause any harm in your life. And it reminds me of being in intimate partnership where you might see your partner have interest or hobbies or things they do that bring them some life and help them, but you don't get them at all. You think they're stupid and dumb. <laughs> and people who criticize their partners and judge their partners for choosing things in their life that make no sense to them. And, and I'm glad I've sort of shifted out of that place of judgment and of like, something's wrong with you. If you like doing that, that makes no sense. That seems sort of dumb. And I hear that too, from people that we work with that they've started bringing in practices in their life that feel good for them that they once thought were dumb as well, or useless, or, you know, not helpful. And that they feel so much judgment from their partners. Um, and how unpleasant that feels. Yeah. Right. And so I really like just recognizing that we cannot understand something and it can totally not be for us. And we can still be excited for someone to have that in their life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And noticing the manifestations of whatever that is, you know, you might think something's dumb and stupid. And, but you notice it brings a smile to your partner's face or they seem more, ba you know, balanced and grounded or, or whatever it is, you know, how is that manifesting outwardly? I think oh, these are yeah. really important clues for us to notice. And I think especially when they're things that don't bring harm, right? There's so many things that people use as coping mechanisms that might feel good in the moment, but actually cause more problems for the person using them or the person, you know, everybody else, it sort of ripples out. Like, let's celebrate when someone we love and care about finds something that lights them up a bit and doesn't cause harm to them or other people, mm -hmm. even if you totally don't get it and would never do that thing yourself. Yeah. That's such an interesting one. You're making me think about video games and alcoholism, a uh, separate mm -hmm. thing that is things that for the person doing them might feel safe and good and in some way exciting or engaging. And for those around them, it might appear like actually that's, that's really dimming your light. You know, I see you being not engaged, but for the person who is doing it, like if that's all they can access right then, that's such a challenging situation to be in. Um, and especially if we don't know ourselves and we don't know what it feels like to be feeling like we're shining bright or like we're feeling more dim and, and just needing to mm -hmm. distract from that. Mm -hmm. Well, it reminds me, and I think this is a key discernment is like, there are many things we can do in life in moderation that are not terrible things or not that harmful. Right. But like, are we using it in moderation? Is it our only thing? Is it our only go-to thing? Is the only thing we believe that can support us and help us? And also, are you video gaming and having drinks to give you a little bit of spaciousness from what feels a bit uncomfortable so that you can go back to it and feel the thing and explore the thing and ask for help with the thing and work on the thing that's hard? Or are you using video gaming or... Um, drinking, or even your rituals, right? Mm -hmm. To completely distract and never actually come full circle back to the thing that felt hard, the yeah. thing that felt hard to face, scary to face, right? I think how we use things makes a big difference, not just what we use. Yeah, for sure. Our ego mm -hmm. and our dissociation can co-opt any tool at all. So yeah, coming back to mm -hmm. intention being important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Did you want to say more about how your body lets you know when something feels true and in alignment? Nope. Nope. Oh, okay. I'll share a little bit. <laughs> Great. <laughs> it's, it's interesting because it's very similar. It's an energy that wants to come out of me. It wants mm. to come out of me. It, it wants to move me forward. Right. And for me, it's about like, I think what 
is music and guitar to you is like talking to people for me, like Mm -hmm. really engaging with people. Like I love people anyways. Um, but I also can be like a hermit and like really not want to talk to anybody. And I didn't actually discover that about myself until I gave myself permission to not talk to people. And until I learned how to be with the utter discomfort and horror of being by myself, um, I realized, Oh, I actually do enjoy time on my own. And, um, and I feel it. I feel like, Oh, I, my curiosity for people is like way bigger. My, um, the smile comes faster on my face. I look at people's faces more, right? When I'm sort of like out and like in hermit mode and like in a more downer energy in my life, a harder time in my life, like I re- I notice I don't look at people's faces in the same way. Mm. I don't have the same wonder for people in the same way. And um, another sign for me is when I want to collaborate. I love collaboration. Like I I have this phrase that I've always loved, joyful collaboration. Like when you find the right people to work with and create with, that excites me so much. And when I have like no desire to collaborate, I know like, ooh, it's a different kind of energy I'm living in right now. It's a different season right now. Mm -hmm. And so when I get excited again and my ideas flow for like, oh, you know, I could get together with that person. We could create something like this or like that's when I know. But another thing I know is, when I want it, like, <laughs> if you could oh, see yeah. me, right? I have that for excitement, bouncing. That, like, bouncing up and down, the, like, yeah. I want to wiggle my body. Yeah. That's how I know. Like, <laughs> something has come alive that has yeah. been dormant for a while. And like you said, <laughs> that part of me is always there, I think, because it's true to me. It's me. But like, Mm. sometimes there can be so many layers of stuff on top of that, that make that really pretty inaccessible. Mm. And I've learned, like you said, to not make that wrong. It's not wrong that I have 15 layers of like hardship on top of that. And I can't access the wiggles in me and that excitement in me. It just means I'm in that particular season of life. Um, Mm. But I know that if I'm gentle with myself, if I'm willing to let other people support me, if I'm willing just to allow the feelings that exist to be there and not make them wrong, those layers start shifting, they start dissolving, and then that room for the wiggles to come appears. Yeah. And then I get to enjoy that state and that season of life. So, yeah. yeah. So I think that's my desire for people listening is to be able to identify things like wiggles. I, I identify with that a lot, happy dog wagging that I do pretty frequently. If I'm not able to access that, if there are too many layers on top, what my desire is, is for people to be able to notice that and make space for it, as opposed to just disappearing forever under the slop and just thinking, oh, I guess I'm not a wiggly waggly person anymore, you know? Oh, how sad to believe yeah. that. Yeah, mm-hmm. totally. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes Some the wiggles like, are just away for a little while. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they're just, yeah, they're not top of body. <laughs> and one day they will be again, but yeah, one we can't disappear. Will be again. Yeah. And that's the thing is I also know this wiggly feeling I have right now, it might not completely go away, but it could change mm-hmm. or it might completely go away for a while or for a day or for six months or whatever. I don't know what life is going to throw at me and how that's going to impact my connection to the excitement and the wiggles. But I do know life is going to change. Life doesn't feel the exact same way every day, every moment, every month, right? And that has been something that's really helped me is learn to enjoy the wiggles when they're present. Learn to know that the wiggles disappear sometimes and that they also come back, mm-hmm. right? Um, and that that was, it took some really intentional work for me because I used to be afraid to enjoy the wiggles because I thought they'd go away. Um, and then when I felt them going away, I felt gross and scared. And then when I, they were totally gone, I was like, well, maybe it's going to feel gross for a long, long time and the wiggles will never come back. And I know a lot of people that feel that way. And I draw this graph for clients when I work with them and, and I show them, you know, how they, they don't seem to enjoy the highs they don't enjoy the dropping down to the low. They don't enjoy the low because it terrifies them and they forget that things get better. And then I circle the whole graph and I say, this is your life. 
<laughs> just over and over and over again. And then we, we laugh about, and there's no, it's no wonder that life doesn't feel good for you. Right. When we don't know how to enjoy the wiggles and trust that it's going to drop and then know that when we're down low, it's not going to be that way forever and trust that it will come back up. When you grow that skill to know those things and trust that that is the process of life, that is the journey, um, mm -hmm. life becomes so much more enjoyable. And there are simple things, simple things you can do to learn how to enjoy the high and anticipate the lows and be with the lows and ride it out until the high comes again. That's what's really neat is it's mm -hmm. actually not that difficult. Man. Yeah. Yeah. So this practice of noticing how you can tell you're in a good place or how you can tell you're hanging out with people who give you life instead of bring you down um, is just a giant exercise in noticing and not mm -hmm. making the way you feel or behave bad or wrong, but noticing what mm -hmm. you want to cultivate more of and what feelings you want to have more of in your life. Um, when you said the wiggles, you said a few things that cued me to some of my other, um, my other internal and external cues that I'm in a good place. Um, mm -hmm. So wagging, dog wagging is one of them. And <laughs> little pig oinks I do when I'm excited. I go, oh. I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm excited about that thing for sure. <laughs> now I just know that. I'm like, oh, I'm excited. I'm I'm going to have some snorts. Um, but it took <laughs> me a minute to clue in. I'm like, oh, I, I make a sound when I'm excited. And so if I wasn't somehow, for some reason, able to feel the excitement in my body, I could notice that I was making pig snorts, which means that I'm excited even if I hadn't noticed that. Right. I love this. I, mm -hmm. I often, you know, give people the practice of noticing and we'll talk about notice what your thoughts tend to be, mm -hmm. right? When you're sort of in a high, notice what things you tend to do, what actions, what behaviors, right? Notice how your body wants to move. Notice which people you gravitate towards, right? Notice which people gravitate towards you. Um, notice what sensations are generally present when you're in that good place. And then they can catch it. They're like, oh, this is a good place. And then if you can catch it, you can also enjoy it for one breath longer. Most of us don't know how to enjoy what's good and uh -huh. enjoy it for one breath or three breaths longer, right? We're just like, okay, well, this is good. That's nice. Uh -huh. And And then also do the same practice for when I'm in a lower place, right? What do you, what are, what's a sign? Like this really helped me is thoughts that I have when I'm in a more dysregulated place, a lower place are what the heck is wrong with you? Right. What's your problem? And I think that about other people, not me. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and that's how I know I'm like, Oh, I think I'm needing some regulation or co-regulation. I'm needing something, something needs to shift right now, or I'm needing just to learn and give myself permission to be in a lower place right now and trust yeah. that that will shift. But it helps to know, oh, I'm here right now, right? If you know where you are, it's easier to have access to, you know, what do I need? What helps in this time? But if you have no idea where you are on the mm -hmm. high, low, middle place, life can feel very scary and confusing. Yeah. Right. And it can be very hard to um, get a sense of what is it I need that I can give to myself or what is that need that I need to ask other people for. But if yeah. you start recognizing, oh, this thought lets me know I'm in a hard place right now. Right. This, the, when I do these things, right. Like for you, if you were like smoking lots of weed or drinking lots, would that be an indication that, hey, maybe something's up? Yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sure. If you start gravitating towards certain people that maybe somewhere in the background, you know, like that's a sign that like, I'm not actually feeling my greatest right now. I'm starting to slip into that self-belief that I'm not worthy or we're all not worthy and life is horrible. You, you start getting to pick up on that stuff sooner. And what's cool about being able to pick up on where you're at sooner is you get to have a choice of, do I want to stay here or do I want to do something to shift out of this? Yeah. Right. Or if you notice sooner you're in a high, it also gives you the opportunity, like I said, to enjoy it more. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. But if we have no awareness of any of it, it, we're just floating through life and you don't get the extra benefits. And then you also tend to stay much longer in the hard stuff. 
Yeah, totally. I think this is really important in relationship as well. Um, I'm thinking about, so one of the signs I have that I'm in a good place and with good people or people who are true for me is an open feeling in my home that anyone mm. can come over anytime, like maybe shoot me a text first, but it feels open. I want to be welcoming. I have, as you're saying, I have positive, compassionate, loving thoughts. You know, if I find myself in a place of thinking people shouldn't come over, something is off or could be better, um, which then made me think about dating people. Um, I, I don't know how to describe this is a really long thing in my mind, but basically not wanting to introduce a love interest to my loved ones. Like that's a good sign. <laughs> right. I mean, and it's so obvious, but in the past it would just be like, Oh, well you won't quite understand them. And like, I just want to keep this like special thing. And it's like, that was, that was really wrong for me. And I didn't, I didn't understand that at a deep level. So if you're trying to hide someone or something or keep things separate, something in there is worth looking at, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Very neat. Yeah. And social connection is the last one. When I'm feeling good, I definitely want to be more social. I extend more. I want to see people more. I want to do more things, do more activities, mm -hmm. have more fun, laugh more. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I like that. I like that for you. I like that you're shifting into that. Not because that's the way to live life or the good place to be, but I just love that you're shifting out of an old season into a new one. Me too. <laughs> and we knew that you were in a bit of a heavier, darker season. Yeah. And we also, I think, knew that that would change eventually. Yeah. And I think those are things that we might not have had that much awareness of in the past. And that might not have brought solace in the past. It probably would have just created anxiety in the past. Yeah. So it's nice. I think we've grown our muscle of how to be with, be with what feels good and, you know, be yeah. with what feels hard, be with what feels uncomfortable to be with. And sometimes what feels uncomfortable to be with is good. The good yeah. stuff. <laughs> yes, totally. Yeah. I think in the past when I was in a low, I would have been waiting for the high and unconsciously just expecting that the high would last forever, you know? So then mm -hmm. the next dip would be, an accruing of devastation, you know, it's like, Oh yes. God, I, things were so bad and then they got good and now they're bad again. So that's like worse and just collectively worse until we die. And like, what's the, what's the point? Yeah. I spoke to someone recently who said, I drew the graph. I drew the graph of, you know, the up and down of life. Right. And we talked about, you know, his experience on the high and the dropping and the low He's like, oh, yeah, I relate. Like, I don't enjoy any of those places, right? And then we drew a different graph, which was like this upward slope of like just always getting better and then getting to the supreme high and then riding that supreme high forever. And he's like, yeah, I just want to hang on to that goodness. I can't hang on to it. And then we explored like, is that actually a helpful desire to have to hang on to the goodness? right? What else does that say? Like, does that say that you, ex you, you expect it to always stay good? You expect it to like, just be on this upward trend all the time? Yes, I do, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then how does that leave you feeling about life? Because life certainly, I'm, I'm pretty sure your life doesn't look like that. Doesn't mm -hmm. feel like that. And he's like, yeah, feels pretty crappy. I'm really hard on myself when I can't hang on to the good stuff and hang on to the good moments. Well, what if we're never meant to be hanging on to that stuff? We're just meant to live in it and enjoy it and let ourselves feel it a little bit more for one breath longer. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's definitely a more easeful life to not expect that you're just always on an upward trend. That's for sure. And it makes mm -hmm. for more enjoyment when you can just be conscious of all of it and be with all of it. I mean, we need that contrast of the lows to appreciate the highs, but we have to be feeling all of it for any of that to be possible. Mm -hmm. And I like that there's little things we can do to help us feel the things that feel hard to feel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Do you want to say a word or two about priming the body for peace and how this helps people feel all those things? Mm. Yeah, I mean, we get to see two times a month. Every two weeks we have live calls. Is it every two weeks or twice a month? Twice a month, yeah. And we get to hear from people of what a difference very simple body connection practices are making for people in their life. Very simple. Like we like to combine body work with mind work and integrate all of that together. But everything we do is simple and can be done with very little time. And what I loved about what someone said is they said, all of this stuff is repeatable. You're right. Like I can just do it. I can do it with you, but then I can take it into my life and I can do it in a one minute break here that I give myself. And uh, I think recently someone was saying for the first time in my life, I feel like I don't need to be fixed. And I'm learning to like be with what feels hard. And now I'm actually feeling and noticing what feels good. And that excites me. That excites me that it's with simple things. People who come in feeling really hopeless and in despair and feeling like they've tried everything. And then we introduce really simple things. And, you know, they're very honest with us. And you're also very honest about your path with these processes, thinking that they were like dumb or useless or whatever. Um, and people will say, yeah, I didn't really think it would make a difference, but I was willing to try. And holy crap, I feel so different. <laughs> I feel so different about myself. I feel so different about life. I feel so different about what's possible. And that's very exciting for me that other people get to experience what we have gotten to experience from practicing these things. Me too. I think even you and I can fall back into the like, oh, it's so simple and tiny. Like, is this of value? And boy, howdy, is it of value. I'm, I'm just always delighted with how transformative this stuff is for people. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel lucky. Me too. I feel lucky to get to put this out into the world, to get to help people believe that something better is possible. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh. It's pretty nice. It is, yeah. yeah. I feel pretty lucky. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Um, is there anything else you want to say before we do a closing practice? Um, I want to say, I think we started off this episode talking about, didn't we talk about like what feels good for our bodies? Yeah. Right. And for probably 75% of this podcast, I don't think if you're listening to me, you wouldn't know if you're watching us, you might have noticed, or, but you might also not have. I have this thing. It's a tool. And it's like a big gua sha, but it's like made of metal. And I it feels really good for me to rub it along my foot. Like I like feeling that pressure mm -hmm. and I have been doing that almost the whole time during this episode because I'm like, this is what I want. This is what mm -hmm. feels good for me. I don't really care if anyone sees it or knows it, but this is what feels good for my body right now. And I think in the past I've been worried, like people are going to wonder, like, am I fidgeting with something or what am I doing? And I guess the whole, you know, moral of the story is like, do what feels good for you if you're not harming anyone and learn what those things are, right? Before I might have thought, oh, this is something I need to do in my own time. Well, to be honest, I don't have tons of my own time. <laughs> um, so this is what I'm doing while I record a podcast, something that feels good for my body. Yeah, that's beautiful. So I hope that's so, a reminder. A, an extension of that then might be that you might notice that you feel extra good in the company of somebody else who's also using a gua sha and not, you know, wondering what people think that might give you some extra kind of life. Whereas you might feel not as good being around people who are like, what are you doing? Like, that's weird. You know, and how totally. might that manifest then in your behavior, in your use of the gua sha? Well, also this morning I texted you, we were going to start at 10 and I texted you. I'm like, I'm having a slow morning. We were like, we had big kid stuff going on last night. And I said, I need a little bit more time. And I said, I'm sorry. 
And cause I like to be on time. I want to value your time. Um, but I also like, couldn't make it work any other way. And, uh, he said, no worries. And I was like, Oh, that feels so nice. It feels mm-hmm. so nice to be like working with in collaboration with in friendships where, and I, we're going to have a separate p- episode about this, but where you're like, that's not an emergency. That's not a big problem. <laughs> you're like, no worries. If we start 15, 20 minutes late, we're going to be okay. Yeah. And I think there was a time in my life where I didn't think that was okay. I didn't think that was okay for me to be the 20 minute late person, but I also didn't think it was okay for the other person to be the 20 minute late person. Although I would have told them it's okay, but my right. inside would have been like, this is not okay. This is not according to plan. You know, everything is going to go to crap. <laughs> Right. Right. But it feels so good for me to be in connection with people, whether it's, you know, just as friends or as people I collaborate with and work with, where I feel the freedom for things to change at the last minute if they need to. And for us to be able to have some perspective of like, hey, this might not be exactly our first plan. And it's also okay. Right. I knew Stephanie would not want me to not eat breakfast and come all frazzled and feel like I didn't tend to the things that really needed to be tended to before I got here. Mm -hmm. Right. You would not want that for me just as a friend. Yeah. And those kinds of friendships feel really good for me. Mm -hmm. Me too. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Chi Chi. Thanks. Okay. Do you have a closing practice for us? Mm, let's go with just stroking your hair or your head Mm. and just noticing, you know, is there a certain part of your head that really wants touch? Um, Is it a certain like slowness or fastness? Is that a word? (laughs) (laughs) How do you want touch on your hair and your head right now? What feels good? what feels pleasant and maybe what you notice is when I touch my hair or my head it then makes me realize this other part of my body wants touch or you know we went with like let's begin by stroking the hair and I notice you and me sort of want to give the head some squeeze Mm. (laughs) some squeezes and some more like massage like touch right so again it's that reminder of like just start with something and then your body's going to give you some new information. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This feels so good right now. <laughs> Digging my thumbs into the sort of where my skull and neck meet. And mm-hmm. actually, this, this really excites me. Every time I find either a new spot that it feels good to touch or a new way of touching that feels good or a combination of the two, I feel like I have won the lottery. I'm a little bit like a dork like that. But I'm like, <laughs> oh, that feels so good. How did I never know that? Ah, I found it. I'm happy. Delightful. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> ah, now I feel very relaxed and like I want to take a nap. Me too. Yeah. And a little wiggle. A little wiggle yeah. then a little nap. <laughs> Oh, delightful. Okay. Well, that's it for this week, I think. think Please do like, follow, and subscribe. And if anything we've said here today has been helpful for you, please share with somebody that you care about. We'll see you next time. Bye.